Thanks, Alan, and thanks for inviting me here. So perhaps to precede that, uh, I'll just briefly describe the resistances that preceded Artemisian resistance, because there's a chilling precedent here. Uh, resistance to the main anti-malarial drug of the 50s and 60s and 70s, which was chloroquine, emerged on the western border of Cambodia. Probably sometime in the 1950s, it spread across Southeast Asia, marched across India. Uh, by the 19, late 1970s, it had arrived in Africa, and by, the ni by 1992, it had reached the western seaboard of Africa, and it killed literally millions of children. So the parasites that killed millions of children in Africa had their predecessors in Asia. The drug that followed chloroquine was sulfadoxin pyrimethamine, and the main resistance mechanism to that drug emerged in exactly the same place and followed exactly the same path. So you can see why we're extremely worried, rightly, that the same pattern is now beginning to emerge. So as ever with resistance, there's a long period when you don't know it's there because it, its multiplication is logistic. So we first really recognized Artemisian resistance in Western Cambodia in about 2007, which is nearly seven years ago. Since then, it's become clear that the extent of resistance is larger than we had hoped it would be. We'd hoped initially it would be confined to Western Cambodia. That's not the case. Resistant parasites are prevalent on the western border of Thailand, eastern Myanmar. How far into Myanmar, I think we should discuss, because that's the critical, I think that's the critical uh, uh, extent of the disease. Uh, it's also prevalent in the uh, southern part of Vietnam and probably is beginning in the southern part of Laos. The problem with it is that artemisinins are our best anti-malarial drugs. They're the, the center of all treatment for falciparum malaria. We use artemisinin combination treatments, and art artesunate has been shown to reduce the mortality of severe malaria, which still kills 2,000 people every day, by one-third. So these are critical drugs, and if we lose them, we're in a very, very serious position. Fortunately, Malaria in the area is still going down, but there is a narrow window of opportunity, I think, to intervene. Whether that window is closed or not, I'm not sure. But certainly, uh, I, my own view is that we're having, uh, there's a lot of talking, lots and lots of meetings, but not quite so much action. Thanks. Bernard, how about a perspective, um, both from your current official role as the uh, Deputy Coordinator of the President's Malaria Initiative, but also as a long-time um, expert in the field of malaria as well. Yeah, thanks. And uh, again, thanks to CSIS for organizing this, because uh, we all need organizations like CIS to continue to raise the profile of what's going on in the region, because that helps those of us working in the U.S. government side to uh, put the full force of the U.S. government behind this. So happy to be here and happy to be with Alan and Nick have spent large parts of their career, well, Nick, everyone, probably no one more known in, in the Mekong region for malaria than Nick. Um, I'm sure sometimes he just felt like Cassandra wailing at the walls, but uh, I think his voice um, continues to be heard, and I think the sort of what you see happening now is, um, is very um, important as far as not only the U.S. government, the Australian government, the British government, the Global Fund, and others sort of rallying behind this. Um, as you heard earlier today, U.S. government involvement in the region on malaria is not new through CDC, and, and I know Alan with Walter Reed and the U.S. Navy laboratory research thing. Um, that primarily, and USAID, um, most of the funding through USAID beginning in 2000 was primarily focused on creating country capacity to the sort of surveillance for drug resistance that Nick and others have uh, have been doing for many years. Um, when the, and also the quality of anti-malarial drugs. When the red flag went up on the Thai-Cambodia border that there was a problem, um, in 2009 PMI, which the President's Malaria Initiative, for those of you who aren't that familiar, was launched in 2005 as an interagency initiative led by USAID with CDC as the main implementing partner. I think the thing that changed in 2009 as we updated our strategy was actually developing what we hope will be a, a response to what's going on in the region rather than just doing more and more surveillance showing that it's an issue. Um, PMI 
since 2011 has increased funding to the region through the USAID regional office. Uh, you heard about the Lower Mekong Initiative and the Health Pillar. That's primarily focused on, again, um, strengthening surveillance capacity in countries to continue to do good quality um, drug studies to know whether or not there is a problem. Secondly, the whole important issue, which you saw in the film, of the quality of anti-malarial drugs in the region, helping countries to know um, at a very local level whether or not the drugs that are in the shops and, and elsewhere are good quality or totally fake or, or, or poor quality. And then thirdly, um, sort of the new component of this is actually engaging directly and trying to drive down transmission, push towards elimination in some of the, particularly in the Thai, Cambodia, and the Burma-Thai border areas where we know there's a problem with drug resistance. In addition to that, um, we do fund some research um, presently around uh, rapid diagnostic tests for G6PD because in addition to the problem with falciparum malaria in the region, there's also, as you know, Vivax. Um, and secondly, the new WHO call for low-dose primaquin in the region um, as part of treatment for Vivax to see how safe that will be as it rolls out. I think it probably will be safe, but just to further um, reassure ourselves in the countries. And then thirdly, some things on vector control like um, spatial springs, et cetera, et cetera. We're obviously not doing it ourselves. Um, we're partners with the others in the region, the Gates Foundation. Our primary partners, of course, are the national control program. So having Dr. Orr and Dr. Hien here is important um, because ultimately they're the ones who are the holders of, of success or failures in the region, and we all need to rally around them. Um, just to, I don't think any of us are naive. There's some major challenges here. Um, there's technical challenges, which uh, I know we'll be talking about more today. There'll be a, another discussion later this afternoon. There's funding challenges. Um, despite the big increase in funding to the region for malaria control, the big bulk of that primarily through the Global Fund. The countries themselves have obviously continued to invest their own resources in that. And then Australia, again, the FID, the Three Diseases Fund in Myanmar, and ourselves. There's also, um, many of you may be aware that the Asia Development Bank is talking about creating a funding platform for health in the region, which would bring additional resources. But there still are major um, resource gaps that we all need to figure out what that means and how to rally around that. And then lastly, I think there was some re reference to this earlier, the sort of uh, making sure there's high level political commitment and commitment all down through the systems, all the way down to the community level, to seeing this as a problem um, and to make sure that whatever we try to do as external funders um, is effective because we're able to actually engage the local actors at a very um, micro level in order to be able to get rid of this problem. Thanks. So um, maybe, maybe a question, just to see your responses. The, um, this sounds like a really important and potentially um, deadly problem if, it, if the artemisinin resistant parasites that are currently found in the greater Mekong, Southeast Asia, were to spread into the Indian subcontinent or in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, um, to me, this has all the bearings of a, literally a global health emergency. And yet, I certainly don't see that level of concern and action from the global community. And I wonder if it is, um, since this artemisinin-resistant malaria, let's be realistic, has no chance of causing problems in North America or Europe, but every chance of causing problems in Africa or India, do you think that might be a a reason why this isn't being considered at the same level of SARS or pandemic flu, and because we're not at risk and others are? Nick, what do you think? I agree. <laughs> I think another, another point about malaria, particularly in the Southeast Asian region, it's a, it's a rural disease, so it's not affecting us who live in the cities or the policymakers who live in the cities. I don't think it gets it quite the, has quite the political pressure that, say, H5N1 or H7N9 and, uh, and would have. Uh, I also think there's a, you know, there's a, we're not very good at really serious, rapidly emerging health problems, to be honest. We're quite good if, if the tempo is slow, but I don't think you can fight this war by committee, and I don't think we can do it just by 
doing a little bit more of what we do already. I think we have to take a radical approach to this. It's like cancer. It's spreading. You've got to take it out now, and that's going to, that's going to move us out of our comfort zone. And we're really not good at doing things where we don't feel really comfortable and can achieve a consensus and have a strong evidence base. Of course we can't. We're going to have to learn by doing. It's a war, and I don't think we're fighting it properly. Well, for those involved in non-communicable disease, I'm not sure cancer is the best uh, <laughs> corollary here, since we're not doing a very good job on that either. But um, yeah, I agree. I mean, but that's, this is a challenge not specific just to this problem. It's a challenge we continue to have. I mean, obviously, most of PMI's focus are in the 19 high burden countries in Africa where we provide support. And as Nick pointed out, the challenge in, in country by country is that this is a disease that primarily very rural, frequently beyond the edges of the formal health system and the political systems. Um, and in the Africa region, it primarily kills um, young children in very poor families. And they don't have a big um, voice in the political system in many countries. So I think that's where we all, from outside and inside, need to continue to um, point out that this is an issue. As Nick pointed out, there is a direct relationship between what goes on in these high burden countries in Africa. I mean, first of all, drug resistant malaria is important for people in the Mekong, obviously, because no Cambodian, no Vietnamese, no Thai, no Burmese, nobody should, be, should die from a drug which is perfectly treatable and to a large extent preventable. Um, so that's, but the Mekong region can, as part of the global public good, um, can give the world um, a very good thing if you can show that falciparum malaria can be eliminated, and beginning particularly in areas where we know there's drug resistance. And in the process of doing that, I think what you learn from doing that will have major implications for how we do malaria programming and support in Africa and also in the Americas. The, the fact that this doesn't get the same level of uh, interest as SARS is just the reality. I mean, SARS, which spreads through airplanes, spreads very rapidly, et cetera, et cetera. And frankly, I'm, um, I don't think that when we keep hearing that mosquitoes fly across borders, there's a very, it's actually people who move across borders that's a problem. I mean, the mosquitoes fly at most two kilometers with a strong wind. So if you wanted to limit yourself uh, to that area, we could have a much more efficient program. But it's really the people moving across borders we need to focus on. Um, I don't have the answers to this, but I, um, I am optimistic. I think we're all optimistic we wouldn't be in this business. Um, I think there's good evidence already in the region, as Nick's pointed out, of overall decreasing malaria transmission in many of these areas. And lastly, you know, the bottom line is the U.S. government is fully committed to doing something about malaria. Um, PMI were $650 million this year. Our Congress has basically appropriated every penny the president has asked for in addition to some. Um, there's no indication that they're going to back off from that. But this is year-to-year -year funding. So despite the, the budget problems here, all of you um, who, through your own wake and influence, the ongoing funding commitment from the US government, that'll be important. All right, thanks. So the you know, in the earlier years, in 2007, 8, and 9 and such, the, a lot of the response to this problem was, a, there was a word used, containment. Um, this was part of the initial World Health Organization documents and some of the strategies. And I think many of us in the community were always a little puzzled by the use of that word containment and what it meant. Um, and. What exactly do you think now is needed? We, some have spoken about a very specific and targeted effort to eliminate the falciparum malaria, all falciparum malaria from the area, because that's the risk point. And maybe, Nick, you could start with sort of discussing maybe the origin of this word containment, and what do you think about um, a truly targeted effort at elimination at this point? I don't think we can contain it in the region indefinitely because uh, unlike many other parts of the malaria endemic world, vector control interventions are not as effective in the, in the region. The, vector, the vectors bite early in the evening, commonly outside, so the, the insecticide-treated bed nets, which are a very, very important part of malaria control, 
in Africa, in West Asia, in South Asia. They're not quite as good in Southeast Asia. So we absolutely rely on the drugs, the drugs which are failing. And so as you drive malaria down, which is this window of opportunity that's narrowing, you basically distill down to the most resistant parasites until the last one is the most resistant. And whilst you can drive it down, we have hope. Once it starts to be, once it reaches a higher level of resistance where the drugs don't work, we are putting it technically stuffed. So I don't think we can contain it. You have to go and try and get rid of it. Fortunately, I think that is feasible. Whether it's going to happen, I think depends a lot on, on the politics, and that's why we're here today. Others may say that it is actually unfeasible, but, uh, but the number of cases in the area is relatively small, and the countries have done very well in, 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 uh, in the control programs, and there, there has been good news. There's increased deployment of, of effective uh, diagnosis and treatment, and the burden is, is still coming down. So, but, the, but when we start to turn the corner, and with further rollout of effective treatments, disease starts to rise, which we've seen before, as I've told you, then without new interventions, and we don't have any immediately, uh, we don't have anything that's as good as the ACTs in the cupboard for the next five years, then we're in a really difficult position. So we're in a race against time. Um, Bernard, maybe some uh, additional comments to that or other views? Uh, no, I s second that. What Nick has just said, I mean, I think the original term containment, uh, it was unclear what success would look like for that. And let's, let's face it, there's a, we know where the resistance is at the moment because that's where we're looking um, and we can't look everywhere. Um, so I think, uh, I totally agree with Nick that what we need to do is concentrate on getting rid of the parasite from the region using what we have on hand. I think there is some experience now that, um, you can go a long way and maybe the whole way, not only with the tools, but with new ways to actually deliver those tools. So we've had many, um, many different sort of causes of this artemisinin resistance that have been proffered over the years. They all revolve around basically lots of parasites encountering not enough drug. And there's various reasons for this to include um, you know, the multi-day regimens that are used, people don't completely, uh, don't complete those regimens. Um, we have some dosing challenges with some of the regimens. Maybe the dosing regimens we use aren't good enough for kids that have higher parasite burdens. Certainly the problems with uh, substandard medications or artemisinin monotherapies. So there's a long list of things that have all been offered and there's some proof to show that there's um, what is the attributable fraction of that? But if based today on what you know, which, which one of those do you think actually is maybe the most important? And if you could do one thing tomorrow to sort of turn the tide a bit here, what might that be? And again, we'll start with Professor White. Well, there are many factors, but if, there was, if you want me to pick one, I think it is the exposure of lots of parasites in an individual person to not enough drugs. So, th for example, if I have 10% parasitemia, 10% of my red blood cells are infected, I've probably got about half of all the parasites if I was sitting in Cambodia in the whole country. It sounds weird, but that's because of the very the log <coughs> logarithmic distribution of parasites. So resistance comes when a person with lots of parasites takes a little bit of drug. And artesunate has been, artemisinins have been available as monotherapies, as sing single tablets, that have been widely used as such for nearly three decades. So I think that was the, that was the pressure that led to resistance. And then the, uh, the uh, and this is no one's fault, that the parasite, the genetics of the parasites in Southeast Asia, basically they're, they're more likely to develop resistance to anything than parasites elsewhere. So their, their genetic backbone is, backbone is unusual. Uh, Bernard. Yeah, obviously you need enough drug to do what you want the drug to do, and that's an important thing. And again, that's where uh, Nick and his group have been at the forefront of helping to sort this out. I think the thing that sometimes, in addition to that, once we know that, the thing that I don't want to say it's been overlooked, but there doesn't seem to be as much uh, attention paid to is then, well, how do you actually get that drug into that person, um, particularly in an area where you have a very vibrant private sector and people are not necessarily going to clinics where 
you know, clinicians or whoever may be trained to do that. Um, and that's where, frankly, a lot of the poor quality and fake drugs are being found is actually in the private sector. That's a real challenge in the region. And I think, again, we all need to work with countries to strengthen their capacity to deal with that issue. And secondly, um, the migrant slash mobile populations, um, we in PMI working with the countries are really trying to, and some of the NGOs in the region are really trying to understand that, both through um, village health worker models, where you're actually able to get whatever the tools are out to a very much more local level, but also um, through some other innovative things such as, part of it is letting people know, for example, opening, there, there are border clinics on the Thai um, Cambodia border and also on the Thai Bur Burma border now, but people need to know about those. So how do people know about that if they're moving across the border? How do they know where they go, particularly since there's not a political framework which would allow them to go always to the local clinic? So I'll just give you an idea of the sort of stuff that we're doing. Uh, a lot of the workers who come from across the Cambodia border into Thailand, actually it's long distance taxi drivers that are bringing people across. They're not like walking across necessarily themselves. So we've been through one of the NGOs working with long distance taxi drivers so they can actually be part of the education of these migrants, telling them where to go, et cetera, et cetera. There's lots of examples of that sort of stuff, but I think in addition to knowing what the best drug is and what the appropriate dose is for that age, we also need to know how to get that drug into the person. Right. So the, um, there are lots of groups that are, have great interest in, in um, both the overall health and security of the greater Mekong region and maybe specifically on the malaria piece. Certainly my own organization, the Gates Foundation, has been very active in the area. And maybe, Nick, you again have a perspective since you've lived in the area now for, I guess, over 20 years. And do you think all of the, quote, external folks like the foundation and the Global Fund and OSAID and DFID and PMI, do you think we do more harm than good or more good than harm? And what could we do differently that might actually make things better? I think on balance you do more good than harm. But I think I uh, the without being too cruel, I don't think there's been wonderful coordination, despite all the fine words, um, between all the donor agencies. Uh, but I also think that the structures for delivering, uh, the executive structures for delivering something radical are just not there. Um, so it's very difficult to, uh, for example, if we wanted to er eradicate smallpox in the region today, it would be very, very difficult. We just don't have, we haven't set up the structures to move quickly and effectively and to cross borders despite endless meetings about cross-border interaction. Let's be honest, they're not that good. So it, I'm just not sure we've got the mechanisms in place to effect a radical strategy. Uh, but I think there is, uh, on the good side, uh, you know, it's been very encouraging to see the, the uh, increase in, in donor interest and, and money on the table and the Global Fund 100 million, I hope, is going to be uh, effective, but uh, I'm not, to be honest, very optimistic. I think in following on with, I think, some of the comments of our colleagues, Dr. Orr, today and last evening as well, the, this um, perspective at the country level when you're, on Monday you meet with the Gates Foundation and on Tuesday with PMI and on Wednesday with DFID, um, everybody has their own, you know, here's our style, our template for our you know, here's our report structure, and I, I've seen a little bit of this on the other side as well, and I, you have to, on a good day, you have to have a sense of humor, right? Um, so I, I agree. I think there is a, um, um, a problem here in terms of coordinated action. I, I would say that, you know, just in the last year or so, there's been a lot of discussion between ourselves, the PMI and OSAID and others. There certainly is an attempt to think about this, but, you know, Bernard, what do you think about just a broader sense of what Nick was talking about in terms of do we really have the structures in place for this radical action that I, you know, I see this as a public health emergency, and if you were, if you were president for a day, what would you do? Which country? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your choice. Um, well, I, you know, we, everyone 
sort of like the weather. Everybody talks about coordination, but nobody does anything about it to a large extent. But I think the problem we have at the moment is, well, first of all, I would ask that the research community in the region also be coordinated um, so that the rest of us know how then best to flow our funding so we don't end up whatever Gates might fund, PMI should maybe fund something else or, or plug the funding gap. And, and uh, I know Nick is um, one of the major research institutions in the region. Um, and AFRAMS and all the other, the national research institutes, they themselves need to have some sort of a coordinating mechanism. Because frankly, I think that's one of the least coordinated parts sometimes I see when I go in. Donor coordination, which is where I, the hat I'm wearing at the moment. Um, I think the challenge we have at the moment is there's probably too many things trying to be coordinated. Um, the Global Fund Malaria Grant is setting up a new structure called the Regional Steering Mechanism, which is to coordinate the $100 million from the Global Fund. Um, there's the new Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance with the President of Vietnam and the, the Prime Minister of Australia, which will be set up uh, under the Asia Development Bank. And then there's the WHO Regional Hub um, in Phnom Penh, um, which is going to be coordinating the technical aspects of this. Um, so we have lots of different coordinating mechanisms at the moment, and I don't have the answer to this, but I think at some point in time, how does this all come together? Mm -hmm. But we also don't want to move away from the fact that most of the coordination, despite the fact the need for cross-border collaboration, um, you know, there's still a lot of malaria inside the borders of these countries. In PMI, we fund the National Malaria Control Program gaps. Um, and we work with the National Malaria Control Program to update those plans as new tools or recommendations from WHO and others come along. So our coordinating body is actually the National Malaria Control Plan. And I can't speak for the other bilaterals, but I think that's the intention is to, going back to the three ones, one National Area Coordinating Plan, one, one national m and &E system, and one national leadership. Um, how that fits into all the discussion, I think the challenge at the country level is, a country like Thailand, where malaria in large parts of the country no longer is a problem, if you talk to Dr. Weichai in Thailand, their challenge is getting their own government to recognize that it's still a problem and they need to remain committed to this. Um, I think any one of these countries, we from outside, whether it be with new tools or whether it be with new funding, can only do so much. It really gets down to what's going on at the country level and making sure that there's coordination between the ministry, the Ministry of Finance, there's one plan, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I think um, I'd like to open it up to the floor now and to see about some questions. I know there's lots of folks in the room who've had experience in the area and lots of representatives in the countries, and uh, we can start with uh, a couple questions. And as previously, if you could just identify yourself. Uh, and, good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. I'm based here in Washington, and I come from Kenya. I, I agree with Dr. Pennett on collaboration, coordination, and funding. I think as we are here all, the organizations that do funding should look coordinated so that they know what they are funding. If it's a mosquito nets, it's a mosquito itself, or it's medication. Because I come from Kenya, where malaria comes from, and we thank the United States government for supporting Kenya so much and African countries that are involved in, in malaria and HIV AIDS. So how do you work with the local people on the ground? They know more about what is needed if it's uh, through common hygiene of cutting grass or uh, removing mosquitoes or water, stagnant water. I think most of the funding should go to the local people, even where we are talking Vietnam, Bangkok, they should coordinate with the government and especially the grassroots people who understand the problem of malaria. I think the common people can fight malaria collaboration with the government. So how do you work with them and how do you work with us looking at funding, collaboration and coordination? Thank you. Hello. Yes. Um, I would like to um, 
ask a question. This is from the implementation and the practical point of view. And as you may know that uh, we try very hard, whether it's come from donor or from the government, in order to uh, help our people to tackle uh, this kind of uh, not only drug resistance, but also uh, we have to think how can we put uh, together the effort uh, to contain the malaria drug resistance together with the uh, strategy for the malaria elimination uh, together. But as you may know that uh, no matter what we talk between the donor and the government on how we have, but the main point is the people, that they really need help from us. And oftentimes for the day-to-day -day, uh, working, I see that we talk a lot. So this is come from the first comment that you raised uh, at the beginning. We talk a lot, but we do less, you know. So the people cannot wait for our talk. And based on my experience is that uh, uh, by the time we start talking and by the time we actually get into the implementation, it takes very long time. And the people may already die. So is there any mechanism or is there any experience that we can learn that uh, the action can take really quick when we identify the problem, forget about the politics, forget about the whatever, the complicity or whatever, that we can really get into the people in, in the community, because people in the community, they really need uh, help from us, you know. Because, for example, if I live in the community and I get malaria, where do I go? So I should know, you know, I should receive enough information about the healthcare services. I should know whether the drug that I'm going to take is really real drug <laughs> that is not uh, make me to be the drug resistant, for example, like this, you know. So is there any idea or thought about this? I think this will be more useful for the practical point of view. Thank you. Okay, we can take a couple more questions and then we'll come back to the panel. Good morning, Suli Panuwong from United States Pharmacopeia, promoting the quality of medicines. Uh, with respect to the quality of anti-malarials, so that has been, you know, one of the key factors, I think, contributed to the resistance that we are facing today. Um, just for example, the threat is there. The issue is there about the spread of the artemisinin resistance to other regions. Now, if we look at the practical part, only one piece say, banning monotherapy of oral uh, artemisinin has in the region a policy in place, looking from the political point of view, looking from the programmatic point of view, looking from the technical point of view. The malaria control program issued a ban monotherapy, for example. And the Litton has been consulted with the other sectors, like a medicine regulatory authority, who has the function overseeing the quality of uh, medicines. Secondly, with the higher level, there's no mechanism whereby the coordinated way among these cross functions work together. That's one piece of the impractical in the country level. Now, when we talk about the donors, they come with different time, with different mandate and objective, as uh, you know, the panel mentioned. Coordinating among them also create a challenge at the country level. Because they come at different time, even though they are talking about complementing each other on the efforts, but at the country level, it's very difficult for them what to please, who to please, and people are keep dying. And the other point that I would like to make here is that some agencies claiming they know about the quality of medicine, how to ensure it from the start to the end user's level. And some donors assign the money to them to procure, to distribute, and without monitoring. We know there's general product also substandard. We know that, we have the evidence for it. So this is one of the practical issues 
at the country level that need to be addressed. So I'd like to hear from the panel some thought about this. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. I'm uh, a physician malariologist, just retired from the U.S. Army. Colin Ord is my name. I'm now at University of California, San Francisco. Um, militaries are large, structured workforces and might be part of the answer to Dr. White. Dr. White's comments, but my question for the group is, is how can the U.S. military help and how can and local militaries in Southeast Asia help? Okay, one more, we'll go right here. I have already uh, small questions. Uh, how to work with the private sector to ensure that uh, appropriate treatment to all uh, malaria patients? Because it's one of the bigger challenges for us. Uh, private uh, medical practice, practice also increasing in our country. Many American workers or people they go to the private sector first before going to the public sectors. Now to work with the private sector to ensure that the, the, the appropriate treatment for malaria patient. Thank you. So let's, uh, we'll just pause for a minute and try to respond to these questions, and we probably will have time for a few more. Um, I think the first two questions really came around um, what I call the grassroots action of local people. So these are the folks on the ground who may be living in these rural areas. They're the ones at most risk of actually getting malaria. How do we best access those folks, educate them, provide them directly with services, and and really have them become the best advocate for their own sort of health care. We're dealing with a lot of this in Africa now. Um, maybe start this time with Bernard and just say, um, and ask that question. Any thoughts, again, from either your official or your personal experience on how that might be best done? Yeah, and that, that, again, that, that is a crucial issue because no matter what the research is, no matter what um, getting the, the right tool, it's how do you then make sure that tool is accessible to people at a very local level? And malaria is an important disease to work on for that very reason, as we've already pointed out as a colleague from Kenya. It's, it's not Nairobi. Um, it's out in these rural areas that that's mm -hmm. where the problem is. Our experience, and I think it's also the experience of the Global Fund, even though I see Scott here, I'm not going to speak for the Global Fund, but we all, you know, when we talk about the National Air Control Plan, most countries now recognize that despite sometimes weak government systems, a lot can be done if the, the National Air Control Plan en engages effectively the NGOs, civil society, and the private sector in these countries. Um, our experience in the Mekong with some of the NGOs we're working with, and certainly in Africa, is that um, out there in these very rural areas um, where there may or may not be a, a clinic available, a lot can be done through training community agents, whether it be called community health workers, whether it be specific for malaria or for others. Um, over and over and over again, you see that at a very local level, if there's someone in the community who has some minimal training and is given a good quality rapid diagnostic test and good quality drugs and, and they're being supported to do that, some pretty major things can happen when it actually comes. And that's not a run around the health system. That's actually an extension of the health system in a very logical way. Um, and that's not something that frequently the government health systems themselves can, can deal with in a very rapid pace. But there are, uh, most countries have more capacity to do these sorts of things than they've been able to mobilize. But I think uh, certainly in the, the discussions we have with the Global Fund and with the UK government and, and, and I'll say these are the sorts of things we're also looking at. Secondly, the private sector. Um, lots of experience in Africa with the extractive mining industry and also agricultural industries like the sugar, and, um, sugar plants in Malawi, for example, where the um, private sector themselves are frequently more than willing to invest in malaria prevention and control for the population they serve that frequently is not only their direct employees, but the community, the, their catchment area. And there's actually some very good data from Africa looking at the return on investment for that. The bottom line is it's a great return on investment. Um, I think it, the, the importance of the 
private sector in the Mekong at the moment, very dynamic, you know, new roads, dams, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, provide some opportunities, and also, frankly, economic growth, provide some opportunities to figure out how to best engage the private sector around some of these issues. That's best done, obviously, by the government itself with us supporting that, not people from outside. Um, and then secondly, there's also a risk, particularly in the Mekong, if you look at what's going on with rubber plantations now being set up and reintroducing the vector in areas where before it was less of an issue, and we've had some experience in PMI working directly with these plantation owners to try to deliver services to migrants when they first get there. So I don't have the answer to everything. All I can say is that if we don't pay attention to this, we can have great tools, lots more meetings, as Nick says, <laughs> lots of coordination. We can coordinate ourselves all over the place, but if we don't figure out, I mean, the end user, the, the goal of this is actually at a very local level to get the goods to those folks. And that's gonna require engaging all the capacity at the country level. Thanks, uh, Bernard. Uh, Nick, anything to add to that? A uh, little bit. Uh, I think the first priority is provision of, a, of effective diagnosis and treatment. And uh, the problem, for example, in Western Cambodia is that there is no treatment currently recommended that will provide 90% cure rates, in fact cure rates are best 70% at the moment, so government here has a role to allow the research to take place which will find better regimes, so there's coordination there. I think the second priority is if you've got, if you've provided effective diagnosis and treatment, then uh, vector control and other interventions if the funding provides it, but then the third point is that we've underestimated the epidemiology of malaria in the area and there are foci, quite substantial foci, of asymptomatic transmission. And here, people don't know they're infected, so the community doesn't know. And this is going to require substantial community engagement if these people, who are the source of the malaria in the unstable endemic areas, are going to, be, to understand that they are the source of the infection and be willing to receive treatments. And this, I think, is a major, major uh, task ahead of us, one we haven't really engaged with at all. I'm, I'm glad you brought that particular issue up because I think that may actually be one of the sort of these new steps and new strategies that really needs to be introduced into these areas about the community engagement and really targeting the asymptomatic reservoir. And I think you also made allusion to another issue which um, in a certain sense we need to learn by doing, which means to be fast and flexible but still very transparent and visible. And I think the, the structures have been put in place globally, uh, all for the best intents and purposes in terms of uh, multiple review steps and institutional review boards and national review boards have actually become paralyzing um, to the extent that essentially nothing can get done. And I think um, the countries, all countries, including the United States, need to um, take a, a really careful look at this to try to liberate this a bit. Uh, that doesn't mean that things can't be done in an open, transparent fashion, but if it takes 19 months to get a protocol approved, then there's hardly a reason to do it uh, going forward. I think just to, there's a couple of other questions that came up, and Colin had asked a question about the role of militaries, both as a potential um, source or reservoir of parasites, because they're a highly mobile population and is also as a large and structured uh, organization that could actually be very effective in the uh, elimination efforts. And maybe, uh, Nick, start with you and just your generic feeling and then just any thoughts on the, uh, the role of the militaries in the greater Mekong. Well, I think if we're going to really do deal with this alarming situation uh, seriously and more importantly, rapidly, and value, value speed, then we're going to have to mobilize sectors way beyond the health sector, uh, and which means moving out of our comfort zone in the health sector. And I think the military, civil society, university students, everybody's got to be involved. This is a really serious problem. And it is a problem not just for Asia. It's a, it, uh, I, I think the whole world, or the whole malaria, potentially malaria endemic world, needs to pitch in here and help, uh, help provide the political support and encouragement to the region, the Southeast Asian region, which is going to have to take on this tough task. Um, Bernard, some uh, additional comments? 
yes, obviously the military is uh, important in these regions because when we keep talking about the border areas, and frankly, that's frequently where the militaries have a big presence. Um, and there's not always a great linkage between the civilian and military populations in these countries where, ironically, sometimes, I think there's a false assumption that somehow the military always has it better than the civilian population when it comes to their access to good quality drugs and diagnostics and prevention. And I think there's lots of examples where that's not always true. Um, it's not something that's easy for where I'm sitting to deal with, but I think our, I know there'll be a session today on mill-mill um, cl collaboration, um, and I st just want to, that needs to be mill-mill civilian collaboration because it's only gonna work if we bring all of these things together. Most countries, I mean, when it comes to a pure funding basis, just FYI, for example, in Africa, and then I talk about the National Air Control Plan, if you look at, in a place where we know bed nets work, um, basically to come up with how many, you estimate how many bed nets you need for a country like Kenya, they actually take the population at risk basis and they then use a factor of 1.8 persons per bed net. They don't subtract the military population and then do that. And in none of the countries I'm aware of are they subtracting the military population when it comes to their estimated needs and funding gaps. The problem is that there's not always a good linkage between then the funding, the civilian population, and the military population. We need to do a much better job on that. I'll also just point out that all sorts of things can happen, which um, I, mean, there's, I know CDC, Patty's here, um, just published an article on a case of falciparum resistant malaria, which showed up in Guatemala, a country where this was just, you know, Central America still has 100% chloroquine sensitivity, as far as we know. Um, and this was a, a military person who had been deployed to Africa as part of a peacekeeping force. So why militaries themselves can't either do presumptive treatment for everybody coming back from a malarious area, or, I mean, those of you who've spent your careers in the, the military, I'm sure have some good ideas about that, but I don't know why it, it's just not doable. It seems so straightforward in some ways to me, but it's not happening. Yeah, I would agree. That's, you know, certainly in the current era, there's um, several global militaries that are now participating in the uh, um, UN peacekeeping operations. And so whether it's Cambodia or Guatemala or others are actually being deployed to sub-Saharan Africa um, on these missions and then returning. So this can go both ways. I think um, very mobile populations, so at risk. If I can take the liberty of combining uh, sort of the last two questions, one was on the Artemis and monotherapy, and the other was on the private sector, and I think they, they certainly can and very much are linked. And the private sector, in some ways, I take the, the yin and the yang of this, uh, it's the source of you know, some of the, the poor practices, but it's also um, a source of great accessibility. Uh, the private sector can be everywhere. The public sector has difficulty being everywhere. So how do you take advantage of what the private sector can offer and yet avoid the downside, which is the proliferation or the use of monotherapies? And then just recognize in our own country, we know very well that you can have great guidelines and great policies. And some of us have worked on guideline committees religiously and feel great about it. And then you go out and survey and what's done in practice in the community and you realize that it sometimes dramatically varies from what's in the guidelines. So this is not a unique problem to rural Cambodia. This is a generic problem as we deliver medicine. And maybe, um, Nick, uh, take a stab at that. Yeah, I think this is a, a difficult one. Uh, the regulation of drugs in, in many uh, endemic areas is, is weak. Uh, the ability of national area control programs or uh, all health programs to monitor drug quality is very poor. The number of laboratories available to do these measurements is, uh, is, is limited, but it's critical. And I absolutely agree that, uh, with Professor Heehan that the private sector uh, is still a very important uh, component of, 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 all, uh, of all infection uh, treatment, but malaria is one of them. So uh, I don't have any magic solutions other than to say I think that uh, the that legislation needs to be strong. I think that artemisinin monotherapy, that the ban on artemisinin monotherapies in the, in the private sector was a, was a wise move, but it's been a 
one that's been quite slow to come to completion, and they are still available in the areas, in the Southeast Asian area, providing drug pressure. So I think further, uh, further persuasion, but also I think we need to be quite creative with the private sector to provide incentives too, as to how they could, as to ensuring correct prescribing practices, the very difficult issue of uh, how we can incorporate diagnosis in the private sector. Uh, these are big challenges, which I don't actually have very good answers for. Bob Berner, comments? Sure. I mean, just add on what Nick said. First of all, I think we need to be, I, I get a little frustrated sometimes when we talk about the private sector because it's not clear always what we're talking about. In this particular case, obviously, we're talking about presumably private sector shops delivering anti-malarials, but we also talk about private sector that's doing the manufacturing of these anti-malarials, private sector that's doing agriculture, and we tend to, what, the reason I bring this up is because it's important when we talk about the private sector, what are you actually talking about? Um, for example, in the Africa setting, which I know a little bit better than the Mekong, but I assume similar issues going on in the Mekong, you can have licensed shops unlicensed shops, grocery stores, and itinerant drug sellers, your ability to actually do something about that is obviously quite different. If it's a licensed shop, and if the government regulatory authorities have some resources to do their jobs, then you can figure out what you should do to make sure there's actually good quality drugs in those licensed shops. Many countries have not only banned monotherapy, well, not many, but some countries have banned um, over-the-counter cells of anti-malarials in certain settings in the Americas, and I think we're going to be seeing, that as part of an elimination strategy, we may start seeing some of that in some parts of Africa as well. That's a different thing. Um, when it comes to people with just going around selling drugs um, through the, a camel or a horseback, that one's just going to be, you know, that, that, gets, that just, if nothing else, demonstrates the, the big demand for these drugs. I think the more we're successful in actually rolling out diagnostics, training people, educating people that not everything is malaria, um, hopefully some of that demand will start decreasing. There'll be less incentives for some of this. So going back to the USP work, which um, in the Mekong region, you know, they've tried very innovative things because not all of these shopkeepers selling drugs actually want to sell poor quality or fake drugs. They just don't know that they're poor quality or fake. There's a new technology out there, which some of you may be familiar with, that FDA's been involved in helping to evaluate, which may um, make it possible to do this even a, a bit quicker. Um, we've been funding uh, USP and others with mobile labs and training people out in rural areas to actually use these labs, um, to actually go in and see what's going on. I know USP at one point in time when I was out in the Palin area had done something creative here in the United States, we have something called the PDR, which every physician, um, you know, when the patient comes in and says, I'm taking a blood pressure med, well, which one is it? What's that little blue one? You know, it's that little, uh, they know not. So you actually have pictures and you can go in. I know USP tried that. I don't know how successful it was, but uh, it, I think it's an interesting effort to actually help the shop owners themselves know what's a good quality and what's a poor quality that they shouldn't be buying. So, um, I'll just stop there. I just think we, when it comes to, as Nick says, it's not just about banning. That's an easy thing. You know, it actually is about education. It's about the supply chain, and it's about regulatory enforcement. Even here in the United States, if we didn't, if shops weren't afraid they were going to lose their licenses if they didn't abide by these, then we would see a lot worse stuff than we probably already exist over in CVS. That's right. Um, I know there was a few additional questions, so I think we have some time. There's a couple here. Thank you. My name is Jin Ningwen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. And I was thinking of the civil society, but you have touched on it. So my question is, can we utilize, uh, utilize this as an opportunity to build uh, infrastructure in many different ways? to deal with communicable disease and many other disease in the Southeast Asia. And one of the strong infrastructure that I've heard that we're lacking is the human infrastructure. And I'm very thankful that Dr. Nguyen is here because 
I think from the concern of Dr. Orr and Dr. Nguyen, Cambodia and Vietnam share many same challenges. I understand that similar with the question raised of the role of military and civil society, the infrastructure networking in the community, is there a way that we can work with Cambodia and Vietnam and Southeast Asia to build into education from elementary school up uh, into many other communities and especially Vietnam, I know we have a very effective secret service Every six Vietnamese, there's one or two secret services built into the community. And right now, I understand that even in the pagodas or in the churches, there are priests and monks that are um, following the Communist Party instructions. Is there a way that we can use them effectively to help the people that will actually give out the good, positive um, incentive for both sides, mutually benefiting for the people. I would really help at this moment in time. So can we take this opportunity to talk about the long-term infrastructure built-in effect that will help everybody to contribute to a better, more positive effect in the future, long-term future? Thank you. Thank you. I think there was one question right there. Thank you very much. My name is Lamin Sar. I'm from the Gambia with my colleague, Dr. Jalo here. Um, we came just because we wanted to understand how this partnership is actually shaped and structured and uh, how it works uh, out in the Mekong area because we are very much interested in similar relationships that do exist within the African context as well. But my question is, Given this situation that's happening with this drug-resistant malaria um, and the Africa's history of dealing with these issues, should we push the panic button now? Um, how do we begin to communicate uh, these issues uh, so that at least uh, from a preventive uh, infrastructure development, Africans, we can begin to work on an initiative uh, to, to be prepared at least to deal with this because we're already dealing with drug resistant malaria issues in the continent. Thank you. So we, I think we can take one more question over here in the corner. Thank you, um, Mike McDonald. Um, Health Initiatives Foundation, Inc., and we work on the Vietnam Resilience System. Um, I'm just wondering, I was getting an impression about something that I, I don't think you meant to uh, imply, but I just want to clarify. Um, under conditions of global change, we have a lot of mobility and we have climate change. And under those circumstances, you had implied that the mosquitoes will not have much range, but in fact, if the drug resistant strains come in to areas in which there are already mosquitoes that um, can carry that, uh, malaria, that form, strain of malaria into the population, then couldn't we have actually uh, malaria moving into the Americas through the blood like um, it, uh, the one Ogawa came into Haiti in the gut? And what we've seen is that the mosquito populations appear to be going north. So why wouldn't we see actually a much more dynamic scenario which might be harder to, to control? Great, thank everyone for those uh, questions. I think we can start with uh, the first one about the longer term capacity, both infrastructure and a lot of human capacity. And maybe the way to frame that is that in areas uh, like much of Southeast Asia now where the actual prevalence and incidence of malaria is, is low and getting lower, that at the village level, malaria may not be the number one problem at the village level or even in some of the individuals. And yet we're very interested in these drug resistant parasites and our desire to eliminate them. So our concern and desire may be greater than sometimes what's seen at the village level. 
And one of the ways to, to work on that is to make sure that you're always addressing the problems that the people in the, at the community feel are their major problems and making sure that does get addressed, but then also making sure that you build in this uh, malaria piece. And then, of course, we, we hear constantly um, this is a more of a multi-sectoral issue in terms of education as well as a longer-term issue, which means the human capacity and training. And it's not just expatriates or people from the capital city coming in and trying to help. So um, again, someone with a lot of background in the area, Nick, um, any thoughts or a little perspective on that view? Well, I, I hope we, we don't have to uh, have a long-term plan for this, for artemisium resistance. I'd like to get rid of it first so that uh, community health development can concentrate on other things. But I think Alan's point's an important one, that often, even in these particular areas where artemisium resistance is prevalent, it's not the most important problem. And so the education and involvement of the community and understanding, it's a bit like vaccine coverage here. You, know, you don't see measles anymore. You don't see mumps. You don't see whooping. Well, you've seen whooping cough actually coming back. But you know, how, do you, how, do you engage, how do you inform people of the need to keep these nasty diseases away? I think that's a big challenge, and we've got to do that. I, I, I hope we're not still talking in 10 years about the need to develop community involvement in malaria control in the area. I hope we've got rid of it. Um, Bernard, a thought on that as well? Yeah, I, I, I again agree. I think that there will always be this, well, there is a tension at the moment and it will continue, but it's an important tension between the need for an immediate, coordinated, robust response to a real global health emergency, the emergence of Artemis resistance in the Mekong region, and it's the, the possibility of spread and or arising somewhere else, elsewhere. Um, versus the need to, the longer term view of building up capacity. Um, but I mean, the world of global health has had similar issues in the past. I mean, you know, immunization programs for certain diseases and that, I, I think it gets into the governments and everyone else needing to create some space because what you might need to do in a shorter term for malaria elimination, whether it be mass drug administration or whether it be some new vector control method may not be something you're going to, as Nick was saying, need to do five or 10 years from now. So some of the activities just need to be recognized as being a bit, they're probably not going to build up long-term capacity, long capacity. On the other hand, I think most of, and I guess this is where the lower Mekong initiative, the health pillar of USAID, where PMI is, is all about just exactly that. It's about how do you then, um, create a longer term strategy towards addressing health issues in the region. And again, the, the mobile population not only be affected by malaria, they're being affected by other diseases as well. And I, I think we can take the last two questions and comments and combine them a little bit because I think they are about the mobility and spread. And it's, we talk about mobility and spread of drug resistant parasites from Southeast Asia, but we also have to recognize that we could have what we call de novo emergence of drug resistance to artemisinins, both in Latin America, South America, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think some of the conditions that would be amenable to that do exist, and that that drives to the larger issue of elimination or eradication globally. And then I think, um, I don't think anyone, I won't put words in Bernard's mouth, but I, I don't think anyone was trying to imply that mosquitoes can't travel from point A to B, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really people moving. It's the plane loads of Indian expatriate workers going from Delhi to Dubai, and that's where the large movement of parasite populations were to occur. So maybe just a, a last comment from my uh, panelist here about any issue on the mobility and then maybe a closing um, thought or two from each of you. Nick. Uh, yeah, so one technical issue which uh, hasn't been addressed is whether the Southeast Asian parasites will readily go into vectors elsewhere. Um, it seems an obvious question, but actually mosquitoes are very picky about the parasites that they'll take. So, uh, this question has been uh, suggested to various grant bodies, grant giving bodies over the last 10 years, and nobody has actually funded it. But it's actually critical 
in terms of how you deal with potential for spread. Does the person who's working in Western Cambodia in a forested area who carries a parasite to Burkina Faso, is that person infectious potentially to uh, the Anopheles gambi mosquito? So I think there's some, there's some technical issues, uh, but the, we, would be, we would be wise to assume that it does transmit. Uh, and we would be wise to uh, be very careful about both the mosquito and the human potential. The dark side of my character rather wishes that there was a little bit of incursion of malaria into Europe or North America, because it would certainly gain people's attention. And it would easily be controlled. But it, mm -hmm. certainly, it might help us in the region. And I think that brings on to uh, this the gentleman from the Gambia who says, what can Africa do? I think what Africa could do is to support the Southeast Asian countries uh, and provide political pressure. Because as we've heard, you know, within the ministries of those countries, malaria is, is uh, fighting for attention with other diseases and may not have the highest priority. But what is Asia's problem tomorrow, today rather, you don't want to be Africa's problem tomorrow. Bernard. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, George Clooney um, got chloroquine resistant malaria not once but twice in South Sudan. Um, so we don't hope for that happening, but it does raise the profile, and uh, we do everything we can to, to build on that. So um, we, we don't, <laughs> yeah, we obviously need to keep the U.S. malaria free, but having a few people understanding the problem who at a high level helps. Um, George Clooney, I'm sure, is taking prophylaxis. So. Um, yeah, I mean, just to clarify, and I think what, the, the point is that we need to get the parasites out of people, and, and the best way to do that is with drugs and to make sure that the mosquitoes um, who may be circulating around with some infected mosquitoes no longer have the opportunity within that time period to do this. So when I say that mosquitoes only, mosquitoes moving across borders, that's not the major issue. Um, I stand by that. Um, again, the mosquitoes only fly a couple of kilometers. On the other hand, these, these mosquitoes aren't infective. We don't care where they fly. The issue of climate change is uh, something obviously of big research area, but I think the climate, the ecological changes in the Mekong are what's really important. Unfortunately, a lot of the success we've seen in a place like Cambodia, part of that's related to cutting down the forest um, because these are forest breeding vectors and dwelling vectors, but that's now being reintroduced in some of these issues as part of development pro um, projects, and I mentioned the rubber plantations. So we need to keep our eye on the ball when it comes to this, um, and it's different in different parts of the world. The Gambia, should you hit the panic button? Um, well, I think, you know, in all the countries in Africa where we um, provide support, we also provide support for drug and insecticide resistance. Um, at the moment, there's no red flags, but I think Gambia is a country where you should just work with your government to get it's a perfect country to actually eliminate malaria straight out. And I think uh, the Gambia could be a big player in showing other parts of Africa how best to do that. So let me, um, let me close this session and just emphasize a couple of key messages that um, artemisinin resistant PFAL cipram malaria in Southeast Asia is a clear and present danger. It threatens regional stability and it threatens global security. The elimination of PFAL cipram malaria in this region, which is defined as getting all parasites out of people, is the only solution for this problem. And that I think the solution is really an all hands on deck. This is not one national malaria control program in one country. This is global partners and regional partners. Um, I hope the session has raise some awareness and some clarity for you and wish to thank our panelists, Professor Nick White and Dr. Bernard Nalen. Thank you.